much. It's really a pleasure to be uh, back here giving this talk, and thanks to the organizers for organizing such a great conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, work in progress um, with Nathan Benjamin, um, Jay Ha Lee, who's in the audience, uh, an excellent graduate student at Caltech, and Hiroshi Oguri. Um, and I have to give credit to Nathan for uh, this joke in the title. Those of you who know him will recognize uh, his, his distinct touch. Um, okay, so uh, one of the models um, that we're going to be aiming for in this talk is the famous Cardi formula in 2D CFTs, which is a formula for the density of states um, as a function of uh, dimension and spin. And it says in detail that the density of states is an exponential of some quantities that depend on the central charge times um, a square root of H shifted by the Casimir energy plus square root of H bar shifted by the Casimir energy. Um, and uh, the classic derivation of this result uses modular invariance. And you often hear that modular invariance is not available in higher dimensional CFTs. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, uh, a version of modular invariance that, that is available. It doesn't have the full power of the one that we're used to in 2D and may not be immediately obvious that we should think of it as modular invariance. But I want to try to convince you that, that it is. Um, and uh, if you have a problem where you um, want to apply modular invariance but can't, you can consider using this technology. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk today about uh, something that I, I call the thermal effective action. Um, and uh, so the claim is that it's a kind of modul modular dual for a general d-dimensional CFT. And in fact, this is technology that uh, is, is, is uh, uh, has been well known for a while, particularly to people who work on hydrodynamics in CFT. Um, so uh, this is just a, a case of identifying that it, it's useful for this particular problem and, and applying it. Um, so uh, I'll explain what this is um, and then use it to compute uh, a higher dimensional Cardi formula for a general CFT. Um, and this is really just a field theory derivation has nothing to do with, uh, w w I'm not going to assume anything about the theory being holographic or anything like that. And the formula that we get will apply to free theories and Einstein gravity equally well. Um, and uh, hopefully there'll be time uh, for me to also talk about um, heavy, heavy, heavy OP coefficients, which one can also get um, using this thermal effective action, although the argument is a little bit uh, more involved. So, um, good. So the, the, the starting point, um, the sort of key piece of input for this is the idea that at finite temperature, Euclidean correlation functions decay exponentially. with some correlation length. And if you're in a CFT, the correlation length is essentially set by dimensional analysis to be proportional to beta, which is, of course, 1 over the temperature. Um, and one piece of intuition for this is just the idea that uh, thermal fluctuations destroy correlations. So when the points are sufficiently far apart, um, the correlations decay exponentially. Um, but there's also a, a nicer, I, I think, a nicer alternative point of view um, that's geometrical and, and uh, more general. Um, and this is to think about just taking a CFT and compactifying um, on a circle of length beta. Um, and the key point uh, in this point of view is that um, there's no dimensionless parameter. Um, all betas are equivalent by scale symmetry of the CFT. So when you say you take a CFT and you compactify it on a circle, you don't get to choose anything. 
and you land on a d minus one dimensional theory. And because you're not tuning anything, generically the theory you land on will be massive. Right? You're going to land somewhere in the space of Q of T's. It's going to be a massive theory, unless something funny is going on. For example, if there's some gapless sector that's protected by symmetry. So if you take a free theory, a free boson, um, and you compactify, then this doesn't happen. You do end up with a gapless sector in D minus one dimensions. But that's very non-generic, and I would expect that um, for an interacting theory, uh, um, you'll never get a gapless sector. Now, this argument actually also works um, for, we don't have to just do thermal compactifications. We can put any topological operator we want um, at a point on the, on the S1. Um, and maybe uh, you could say generically this will still be true. Now, of course, we know that in supersymmetric theories, if we do a supersymmetric compactification, then that's a case where gapless modes can be protected by symmetry. Um, so I want to exclude those cases and just focus on what I claim is the generic case in, in thermal compactifications and may also apply to other uh, compactifications, which is that we get a massive theory uh, when we do this. Okay? And that will be, that will be the, the key assumption. And, um, of course, if you start with a CFT, then by dimensional analysis, the mass gap, um, again, which is equal to 1 over the correlation length, um, again, has to be proportional to 1 over beta. Okay? Good. Now, um, this uh, massive theory that we get um, when we reduce the CFT on a circle, I want to call that the modular dual. Um, uh, and the, the difference between higher dimensions and two dimensions is that in two dimensions, the modular dual is the CFT you started with, and in higher dimensions, it's not. Okay? So I think this is a, actually a useful point of view. So, um, okay, so if you have a massive theory, there's a nice way to summarize the predictions of that massive theory, which is to, um, well, what, what this massive theory means is that if you go to very long distances, you can approximate all the correlators in terms of delta functions and derivatives of delta functions. And that's captured by a local effective action. So the idea is to uh, couple the CFT to background fields. Um, and in particular, we're going to be interested in a background metric, g mu nu. Um, and um, uh, if we're doing a circle compactification, then very generally, we can write g mu nu in close decline form. So this is some little g ij, which is a d minus one dimensional metric, plus a dilaton times d tau plus a gauge field. like this. And um, so the way this works is that if we take the partition function of the CFT coupled to G, then this is equal to the partition function of some gap theory coupled to these D minus one dimensional variables, the D minus one dimensional metric, the gauge field, the Kaluzikon gauge field, and the dilaton. And then um, uh, the um, uh, the law of massive QFT is that this can be captured by a local effective action for these D minus one dimensional background fields. And the meaning of this twiddle is that this local effective action should capture the physics on scales much larger than the correlation length. So this should be equivalence up to exponential corrections of the form e to the minus l over the correlation length, where l is some characteristic length scale that you're studying in the d minus one dimensional theory. Okay? And this, uh, this is what um, uh, I'll call the thermal effective action. And um, this, uh, this argument is explained in a nice paper by Shiraz and collaborators, um, where they were interested in uh, applications to hydrodynamics. Okay. Um, sigma. Do I have a sigma? Uh, oh, that's a capital G. Uh, that's that's my bad handwriting.
Good. Okay. So um, uh, the the power of this will come from just using symmetries to constrain S thermal, and um, uh, it will turn out to be pretty highly constrained. And as we know, in effective field theory, when you have a highly constrained action, it makes an infinite number of predictions. And we're going to extract some of those predictions. So what are the symmetries? So first of all, we have d-dimensional um, uh, coordinate invariance. Um, and this implies as usual with kaluza klein compactifications, it implies d minus one dimensional coordinate invariance. Um, and gauge invariance. And another thing we have in d dimensions is vial invariance. Um, so in particular, the partition function of the CFT on a geometry where we rescale, this time it really is a sigma, um, by some position dependent field. That's equivalent to the partition function of the ZFT in the unrescaled metric times a known factor that uh, comes from the vial anomaly um, that I'll call S anom of uh, G and sigma. Um, and uh, so this thermal effective action that we write here has to match the vial anomaly. Um, and if you forget about this S anomaly contribution, it tells us that the thermal effective action actually has to be a function of um, this vial invariant combination G hat, which is e to the minus 2 phi um, times G. And uh, it can also be a function of the gauge field A, which doesn't transform under vial transformations. Um, and uh, this argument here might remind you of the derivation of the dilaton effective action in theories with spontaneously broken conformal symmetry. Uh, and it's basically exactly the same argument, except here we have a theory in d minus 1 dimensions instead of d dimensions. Same idea. Um, so uh, what you find is that this thermal effective action has to be an integral of coordinate invariant functions of g hat and a. And such things are highly constrained. So we can have um, a root g hat. And then, as usual in effective field theory, we have a derivative expansion. The leading term is a cosmological constant term. And then the first subleading terms would be something like c1 times r hat, which is the, um, the scalar curvature associated with g hat. And we can have a Maxwell term, um, and so on. And then we also need, in general, um, something to match the um, to match the vial anomaly that depends on um, the vial anomaly coefficients. So a uh, a and c in four dimensions, and and in higher dimensions there there are more and more terms. Um, so in general, we need to add something here uh, as well. Um, and I won't write it explicitly. Um, okay, so uh, let me just pause for a second to tell you a little bit about this coefficient. So um, this coefficient uh, has several interpretations. One is that it's a cosmological constant in the thermal effective action. Um, another is that um, it gives the free energy density um, of, of the CFT just in thermal flat space. So the free energy is minus this little f times 2 to the d. So for us, little f is a dimensionless coefficient. Um, and I stuck in a minus sign here so that little f uh, will, will end up being positive. So this free energy density is a well-known observable that's been studied in many different contexts. Um, and uh, so for example, um, uh, in the icing model, um, it's just a number, 0 0.153. Um, and so it's a theory-dependent uh, constant. Um, it is related to the one-point function, the thermal one-point function of the stress tensor. Um, so the one-point function of the stress tensor in flat space but with a thermal circle is also proportional to f times t to the d. And this implies in particular that f is positive. Um, so that the cosmological constant is actually negative um, in my conventions. Um, and uh, 
So this positivity statement comes from thinking about the, um, the theory like this and building a Hamiltonian that translates you around the thermal circle. The expectation value of that Hamiltonian has to be positive um, because uh, energies of the CFT on, uh, on this flat spatial slice are positive. And so that gives it F is positive. Um, but there's another way that you can think about uh, um, this theory, this Euclidean theory, which is building a Hamiltonian that translates you this way. Um, that Hamiltonian you again get by integrating the same stress tensor, and so you can again compute uh, its energy density. And um, so this is what you might call the Casimir energy of the d minus one dimensional theory. Um, and that is negative. Um, and uh, the fact that the Casimir energy is negative under a circle compactification essentially just follows directly from positivity of energy in flat space and tracelessness of the stress tensor. So it's kind of a neat fact. I mean, you hear a lot that Casimir energies are negative. Um, and uh, th this, is, this is why. Yes? Yeah. Good. So, so the claim would be for a thermal compactification of a CFT, Casimir energy is negative. So yes. This is the Casimir energy in uh, S1 times Rd. Correct. Yeah, that's right. On S1 cross Rd minus 2. Thank you. So if you change from Rd minus 2 to some other compact space or something, then. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, depends on, it could depend on the geometry. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Good, okay, good. All right, so I'm halfway. Okay, good, good. Um, all right, that's, that sounded good. So to, to orient us a little bit, let's talk a, talk a little bit about what this looks like in two dimensions. So example in two dimensions. So um, there a very nice thing happens, which is that there are no... Um, uh, coordinate invariance terms that you can write down beyond just the cosmological constant term. So the effective action just truncates to a single term. And um, which is just, uh, it's a one dimensional theory. The action is root g times minus f. So it's just minus f times the length. Um, and f in 2D is just proportional to the central charge. Um, and uh, so this, um, this result, uh, we can understand from a more conventional point of view in terms of modular invariance. The idea is that modular dual states have energies um, e sub i, which is 2 pi over beta times delta sub i minus c over 12. Um, and so uh, this S thermal, it captures uh, the vacuum uh, in the modular dual. Um, but it throws out the physics of the higher states. And in this language, the mass gap, this M gap that I was talking about, is it's the difference between the first excited state and the vacuum state in their energies. And that's just 2 pi over beta times the scaling dimension of the first excited state. Okay, So uh, this is a theory of the vacuum state in the modular dual channel. And my claim is that you should think of this in general in higher dimensional theories as also being a theory of the vacuum state in the modular dual channel. So whenever we're computing something that's dominated by that, uh, that vacuum state or the, the um, uh, the long distance sector of this massive theory, then we can use this technology. Um, so here, uh, this, this delta is uh, good. That's a good question. This delta is um, just a regular old delta. Um, let's see. Always two. Uh, hmm. Y 
Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Thanks. This thing on the vacuum state here, could there any compactifying on an F1, not like on an F T minus one or something, then what Hilbert space is that state living in, or is that this language of a vacuum state? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't. Maybe this language of a vacuum state is not great language for the higher dimensional case. I mean, it's a, it's a theory. Um, it's a theory on S1 cross uh, R D minus um, two, and um, uh, the, that, that theory has exponentially decaying correlations, and you're just capturing the effect of these exponentially decaying correlations. Um, okay, so, um, once you have this point of view, computing the density of states is, is actually very straightforward. So for the density of states, but there is a, a surprise. Um, at least it was surprising to us. Maybe it shouldn't have been surprising in retrospect. Um, but I'll try to keep the suspense up by saying there's a surprise. Um, so we want to study the theory on S1 beta cross SD minus 1 um, with a twist by some angular velocities. So we're going to twist by um, uh, twist the angles um, on the SD minus 1 by some set of angular velocities. And this omega vector stands for the fact that we have different, uh, um, in, in general, uh, in d dimensions, we can twist by some number of angular velocities equal to the rank of SOD. Um, so uh, OK, so what are we computing? We have z of beta uh, and omega. Um, it's a trace of e to the minus beta times the dilatation operator plus the Casimir energy on SD minus 1, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then we have these um, uh, this angular twist. Um, and the claim is that this is equal to um, uh, up to exponential corrections e to the minus s of g hat and a. Now, I need to say a few words about this Casimir energy. So this is the Casimir energy on a different geometry. So it's the Casimir energy on SD minus 1 to be distinguished from that Casimir energy. Um, and you often hear that this Casimir energy um, in a d-dimensional theory, uh, in an even d-dimensional theory, is scheme dependent. Um, but that turns out to be a, kind of a, a red herring um, in this picture. Because this, because the, S-thermal has a piece, S-vial, that's deter that, that captures the, um, uh, that matches the vial anomaly. And it turns out that the scheme dependence um, in S vial exactly cancels the scheme dependence here. So the scheme dependence on this side cancels the scheme dependence on this side. And you end up with a really like a true scheme independent Casimir energy, which is which really should be the Casimir energy. Um, one way to say this is that um, uh, for the experts, there are certain terms in the vial anomaly that are equal to vial variations of local counter terms. And the easiest way to do these calculations is to just choose a scheme where you set those to zero. Um, which you can do, and then you never have to worry about this scheme dependence. So, so the scheme dependence of the Casimir energy, it, yeah, it's kind of a red herring, and I think it's kind of wrong, at least in this setting. And it turns out the correct Casimir energy um, is uh, the one that you get by just taking the Euler anomaly part. Um, so there, you just it comes from the Euler um, the Euler term in the vial anomaly. Um, and this is something that was computed by Herzog and Huang a long time ago. Um, and they have this nice formula. It's just proportional to um, uh, the A coefficient. Okay, And that turns out to be the, uh, if, if you use this definition of the Casimir energy in this formula, then it is equal to a functional of G hat and A.
Um, and so now, good. So uh, what I mean by g of uh, s of g hat and a is you have to compute g hat and a in this geometry. So now the the trick is that um, this this geometry, if you just say we have this and we twist by beta omega as we go around the circle, that's not in Kaluza Klein form. Um, and so all you have to do is take the manifold and put it in Kaluza Klein form and then compute g hat and a and plug them into the thermal effective action. Okay, so I'll just write, write some formulas to, um, to be a little more precise about that. You start with a metric, um, and you can start with the metric on just uh, uh, S1 cross SD minus 1. So we have the metric on the S1, um, and then the metric on the SD minus 1. And here we're using what are called radius angle coordinates on the sphere. So this is just the metric on SD minus 1 written in a way where uh, the independent uh, Casimir rotations in the Casimir subalgebra are, are, uh, are given by the theta variables. Yeah? Yes, so, so this is, yeah, sorry, if, if, if D is even, uh, thank you, and, and zero otherwise. Thank you. Yeah, and if you analytically this continue this formula in D, then you get zero automatically and not D. Um, good. So you start with this metric, but there's a twist where tau and theta A are identified with tau plus 1 and theta A minus these angular velocities. And so what you can do is just do a, a coordinate transformation where you redefine theta a goes to theta a plus beta omega a tau, where tau runs from 0 to 1. And this undoes the twist, but makes the metric more complicated. And then you just read off um, g hat and a from that. That's right, that's right. I mean, is this, including this Casimir energy will correctly produce the minus C over 24 in the Cardi density of states. But the first approximation, but the first approximation yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. So uh, leading, leading approximation at very large dimension, it doesn't matter. Um, so, okay. So you, uh, okay. Thank you. So you make this coordinate transformation, you plug it in, and then you compute uh, g hat and a, plug them into the thermal effective action, um, and, uh, and you just chug away, and you get this nice result that the uh, value of the effective action on this geometry takes the following form. So it's the volume of the, of the sphere times uh, these factors, 1 plus omega i squared in the denominator, and the leading term is f times t to the d minus 1. That's the contribution of the cosmological constant. And then, of course, subleading terms in the thermal effective action give subleading terms in the uh, large temperature expansion. So there's something times c1 plus some number times c1 plus a number times c2 times uh, sum over i of the omega i squareds times t to the d minus 3 plus dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Um, the chemical potentials are imaginary. Um, I mean, the, yeah, in our conventions, it's divergent at omega uh, goes to i in our conventions. But yeah, so, so that's an important, that's an interesting thing to note. So there is a divergence here when omega goes to i, and this is the way that this formula knows about the unitarity bound. Um, so when we, when we get out the density of states, we're going to have something that, that has the unitarity bound, at least in the large dimension limit, built into it, and it's because of this uh, singularity. Yeah? Does the final partition function be periodic under certain shifts of omega? 
Good. So you're, I think you're thinking about this 2 pi shift that you used so beautifully in your talk. So that is outside of the sort of thermodynamic regime that we're taking. So in order to get a good thermodynamic regime, the uh, angular twists need to go to zero as, the, as beta shrinks. Otherwise, uh, you're doing something really violent to the, to the sphere as you take beta to zero. So, so that's important. So the parametrics of this are actually important. And thank you for mentioning that. I should have mentioned it. So the fact that, uh, um, so the omegas will be, will be uh, constants in the limit that beta is getting small. Um, good. So now, this is the partition function in the large temperature expansion. And to get rho, we just decompose it in conformal characters, which is a fancy way of saying we basically Laplace transform it. Um, and then the nice thing that happens that um, we didn't really realize was going to happen is that um, uh, the, when you Laplace transform, there's a saddle. And um, it turns out that uh, the temperature for this saddle is much bigger than 1. And omega star is order 1. So the, the saddle for the omegas is order 1. Um, as long as delta is much, much bigger than 1, and the twist has to be bigger than something like root f times delta. So what this means is that um, the large temperature expansion is valid in this entire range. And this includes the whole limit where delta goes to infinity with fixed delta over j. Um, so you actually, uh, so, so what that means is that this leading term captures that whole regime. We, I think when I, when we started doing this computation, what I was expecting is that, um, you know, the leading term would capture the leading density of states and then, then, uh, um, the fluctuations in J would be captured by subleading terms and, and so on. But that turns out to be not correct. Um, and so what this means is that you, if you basically just keep the, the leading term and you do the Laplace transform, you predict a whole function of the ratio delta over J in large delta limit. Um, and so it's a very detailed prediction that basically just follows from locality of this massive theory. And so I'll just write the prediction for you. So the idea is that if you take this formula and you set d equal to 2, then you get the Cardi formula that I started the talk with. If you set d equal to 3, you get this nice expression for the density of states in any 3D CFT that uh, does not contain a gapless sector when you do the thermal compactification. And the formula looks like this. Yes, f is a parameter that's a theory-dependent parameter. And it enters this formula in the same way that the central charge enters the Cardi formula. So that's the difference from two dimensions, right? You knew the value of it. Yeah, that's right. So you need some way of uh, you need some way of computing f. It depends on the theory, and yes, it's not as easy as in two dimensions. Um, so that's the price you pay. Um, so uh, um, that's right. So what's really being predicted here is the shape of this function. That's that's the prediction. And these dot dot dots are, are subleading um, in uh, one over delta to powers. Um, but of course, you can write these down too. They're just parameterized by extra terms in the thermal effective action, which uh, which you can write if you want. Um, and we've checked uh, we checked this formula in uh, in Einstein gravity, and it works. And we've checked it in free theories um, that don't contain a gapless sector when you compactify. So for example, the free fermion, thermal compactification. Or if you take a free boson, you can do a Z2 twist as you go around the thermal circle to kill the gapless sector. And then the formula works too. Um, OK, in my remaining zero minutes, I want to say something about heavy, heavy, heavy OP coefficients. Um, OK, so uh, the idea uh, for heavy, heavy, heavy OP coefficients is to look at a genus 2 partition function and, 
and I put it in quotes because uh, we're doing this in higher dimensions. Um, so I'm not really sure what you should call this, uh, this surface. But the natural thing to look at is uh, constructed as follows. You take two copies of the plane. Where by the plane I mean RD. Um, in each copy, you cut out three balls. And um, so we have three balls here. And it, it, it will be helpful to make them all mutually tangent to each other. Um, and so we cut out three balls here. And then we, we glue them together with cylinders. Uh, this is really challenging my artistic skills. That's dot, dot, dot. OK, hopefully you get the idea. So we, we glue them together with three cylinders. And each cylinder, we can choose the length of the cylinder to be uh, different betas. Um, and what this computes is uh, the partition function on this geometry computes a weighted sum of OPE coefficient squared. times these e to the minus beta factors. OK? So, so now, um, when, when you look at this, it, it looks like we're stuck, because this is not a circle vibration. So what the hell are we supposed to do um, with this? Um, and uh, um, uh, so here, we have to do a little bit of squinting and gymnastics. And um, it turns out there is something to do. So we're interested in this thing in the limit where these, uh, where these betas get really small, because that's capturing the large dimension states. And when, when the betas get small, there's sort of an emergent thermal circle that appears in this geometry. And there are, there are three of them. Um, and let me see, I have colored chalk somewhere. So um, the idea is for what you can do is you can start here at the point of tangency of these things. You can travel through the first cylinder onto the second plane, and then travel up through the other cylinder to the same point. And that's, that's a circle. And when the betas are getting small, that circle is shrinking. Um, and so if you zoom in near this, this area, it looks like there's a circle that's getting small. Um, and I claim that we should think of this as a thermal circle in the neighborhood of that, of that region. Um, and uh, um, uh, so it's true that the whole geometry is not a circle vibration, but there, there is a circle. And so you can zoom in uh, in that region and compute the uh, thermal effective action from that region. Um, and what you find is that um, uh, there is an integral that you have to do. And the integral for the action is dominated by a neighborhood of that uh, region. So we call this region the, the hot spot. So it's dominated near the hot spot. And furthermore, it, it gives something that diverges in the limit that the betas get small. So this hot spot is giving some large contribution to the partition function. And that contribution only cares about the neighborhood of the hot spot. Um, and so uh, what, um, uh, right. So what um, we conjecture is that the partition function on this genus 2 surface um, is equal to a sum of the actions, the thermal effective actions of these hot spots that depend only on these pairwise temperatures. Um, uh, plus corrections um, that are non-singular in the limit that these betas go to 0. So, so the claim is that the hotspot action is a, is a pairwise thing, and it captures the singularities when beta goes to 0. Um, and there's a nice result that I, I can describe uh, afterwards, but it turns out that e to the minus s hot, for anyone who's interested, um, is, uh, is actually equal to minus log of the usual partition function evaluated at a special temperature, um, which has this beautiful formula, 2 cosh inverse of 
2 e to the beta 1 plus beta 2 over 2 minus cosh beta 1 minus beta 2 over 2. So this is, this is a kind of uh, um, nice result that shows that, that the singular parts in this genus 2 partition function are just determined by the, the usual partition function. And in particular, the very leading terms at large delta are just determined by this parameter f. Okay, and now um, uh, once you have this expression, then you have the task of inverting it to pick out these uh, OPE coefficients. And we haven't done that yet. Um, so that's an interesting, uh, um, uh, an interesting thing to do. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't write down the final formula for you for heavy, heavy, heavy. But my claim is that this formula encodes the answer um, in a way that should be accessible. Um, okay, I'll stop. I'll ask for questions. Hi. What happened to the F dependence in that? I mean, why did that drop out? Yeah, so, so F dependence is here. So the claim is that E to the minus S hot for a pair of touching uh, balls is equal to Minus log z oh, in the z, one in two, the z, where z yeah. has f in it. So the the op coefficients will also depend on this undetermined f. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they will just, they'll depend on f. But once you know f, then you then you yeah. But that's you know theory that. dependent. So I mean that. Yeah, it's theory dependent. Yeah. Thanks. Do I understand correctly that there is this non-trivial uh, consistency check with the six-point function? I guess there was this paper recently by Julian and friends. If I take three pairs of operators and I focus on the identity channel on one thing, and then in the dual channel I get heavy, heavy, heavy times this row. So there is a, if I multiply your row by your heavy, heavy, I should reproduce the Tauberian sum in this setting, right? Is it, does it make sense? So uh, I, I wasn't familiar with this paper um, until arriving here, and some, some people were asking me oh, okay. about it. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, but I think that this, this computation seems to be sensitive to different physics from local correlation functions of light operators. Um, I don't know a way that, for example, f is encoded in those correlation functions. So right, exactly. So um, maybe it cancels or? Um, maybe maybe it can. I, what I would guess is that if you study local correlation functions of light operators, that it's very hard to make black holes, and um, so uh, what you're really studying are weighted sums where the black holes are suppressed. That would be my guess. Uh, just one or two comments. Um, first, there's a nice fluid dynamical interpretation of that, that formula for, uh, for the partition function with the one, your one plus beta squares. And the fluid dynamical interpretation is simply this, that um, when you set the, your chemical potentials to be omega, that sets the angular velocity of the fluid. So there's a unique time-independent configuration with fluids which have some angular velocity. And if you work, you know, so you know the stress tensor of that fluid and you integrate that stress tensor, it gives you the energy and, uh, and the entropy that gives you your free energy. I, I, I don't has know if this, it's useful. Has this uh, appeared anywhere? Yes. It has. Uh, we wrote a paper called Large Black Holes from Fluid Dynamics, 2008 or so. Uh -huh. 2007, maybe. You could you find that formula there. Um, that formula? The formula with the partition, the one with the one, one yeah, yeah. Yeah, one, with the one over, okay, one, great. One omega, great. omega squares. Also, second comment, um, you're basically uh, getting your density of states in terms of the one parameter that parameterized um, the free energy. This F was basically the one parameter that parameterized the free energy at high temperatures. Now, if you're interested in corrections to this formula, you know, there are sub subsequent terms, mm. and all those corrections have unknown data, like your f, but all those unknown bits of unknown data have interesting fluid dynamical interpretations. So if, if you wanted to improve your formula to go to higher and higher orders, you could do, you could do so um, in terms of 
again, unknown pieces of data, but all of which have nice fluid dynamical interpretation, just in case this is useful. Okay, thanks. Um, particularly in this second OP coefficients thing, can you extricate the uh, descendants from the like, scaling individual states, particularly because once you put three points on the plane, if you're talking about some descendant operator, then it will depend, a three-point function in some configuration will depend in a complicated way on, on some other configuration. Yeah, so, so the, I think the correct way to do that is to compute the conformal blocks for this funny manifold, for this mm -hmm. genus two manifold. Um, and then fi figure out how to invert those blocks. So we haven't done that. Okay. Um, but that would be interesting to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment on this uh, criterion that delta minus j is greater than square root of delta. Does this have some kind of fluid, fluid dynamic interpretation? Or how, how do you interpret this? Um, I don't have any intuition for the square root of delta. Um, I mean, the, the fact that there is a condition on delta minus j is related to Shiraz's comment. Um, Otherwise it's spinning too fast. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So the, the geometry be, becomes singular at the, at the unitarity bound, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't understand the square root. There's an extension of this. We can go back to the, the dimensions, mm -hmm. which is also interesting from the hydrodynamic point of view. You can write down a certain, so this hydrostatic partition function can be uplifted back to a field theory partition function to include a certain subset of transport data and hydrodynamics, mm -hmm. the non-dissipative ones, not all of the non-dissipative ones, but a subset of them. And that gives you some effective temporal dependence as well. So that's also interesting from physical perspectives. I was wondering if this technology could be adapted to say something more about those coefficients um, in general. So there's a general prediction of what kind of terms you'd write down in such an effective action. And that, give, that would give you a sort of Lagrangian formulation of a subclass of fluid dynamical data. Um, so I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I think this is the kind of question that Shiraz and company were trying to answer with their, uh, with their paper where they were writing down this, this equilibrium uh, so, action. So it's more than that because it also things which are not quite equilibrium. It also has non-trivial time dependence. Right, so is your question, like what is the significance of these extra, of these extra pieces of data? Yeah. Ah, okay. So um, I mean, I know what they are from hydrodynamics, but you could ask what, what do they mean from, from a CFC point of view? I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, in what, uh, let's see, I, I don't see how they appear in, 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 uh, in, in this formula. Um, I, for the heavy, heavy, heavy OP coefficients, we, uh, the computation is a bit more schematic. We can only compute the, um, you know, the singular part of this partition function. So. Maybe I could speculate that they, maybe they could have some role in some in some kinematics for for these uh, endpoint functions. So there's definitely there's more room for more CFT data to enter in these uh, in these endpoint functions. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure. Thanks. In this uh, genus two calculation, is it still appropriate to think of this hotspot action as coming from the contribution of the identity operator and some sort of modular dual channel? Um, yeah, it's it's not an it's not an operator. It's 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 right. a theory. Right. Yeah. The, the idea is that in this so in this vacuum. regime, there's a, a d minus one dimensional theory that emerges, uh -huh. that's that that controls the behavior n near that part of the geometry. Okay, I see. And is it easy to say how this universal formula for C A B C squared scales at large delta A? So uh, it, th that pertains to Henry's question, um, which is that uh, it seems like 
actually working out how the descendants contribute is potentially important. So for yeah, example, for sure. if we take yeah. if we take this formula and we just Laplace transform it and forget about dis distinguishing descendants and so on, we definitely do not land on the C0 function uh, oh, yeah, in sure, 2D. Sure, sure. You know, there's no 27 over 16 <laughs> or anything like that. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so, so, so yes, I, I really can't say without doing that uh, yeah. calculation. Okay. Thanks. Can you? So, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you can just like uh, stick in like minus one to f and then try to estimate the difference between bosonic states and fermionic states, or is it outside the regime of validity? So, if sticking in minus one to the f, um, if the theory has supersymmetry, then that would violate the assumptions that there is no gapless sector. But if the theory does not have supersymmetry, then absolutely um, you can do that. And what 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 happens is that you get an effective action of the exact same form, but with different coefficients. So there's going to be an, an f, a little f associated to that topological defect, the minus one of the f twist. And it's another theory dependent quantity that's very interesting to know. Um, uh, and, then, um, and then you would uh, make predictions in terms of that. Um, so basically for any, I think any uh, co-dimension one topological operator, there's a collection of, of data um, which are the coefficients in this effective action. Um, and those are all interesting theory dependent uh, pieces of data. More questions? Uh, there was a question. Can I ask a question? So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> yeah. So in this formula when you have the three circles, uh, then you put beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Where is the information about the location of the circles, the size of the circles, the, et cetera? Is it all schematic or uh, it's there? Yeah, it's, 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 this, this formula is a bit schematic, but uh, the reason I wrote it this way instead of in terms of C, uh, A, B, C, is because this three-point function depends on where the circles are. Um, and um, uh, so, so what you, what you get is, is, this literally the three-point function squared, um, and um, yeah, the, the geometry is a, is a little bit is a little bit confusing. Basically, you can do lots of different things. You can change the size of the cylinders. You can move the balls around, um, and uh, this um, these these different things that you can do are basically an overparameterization of the moduli space of this uh, manifold. So the I think the correct description of the manifold is that what you're doing is you're taking uh, you're taking the plane and you're identifying via an element of the conformal group. Um, so you have three elements of the conformal group. So G cross G cross G. And, but then you can, you can do uh, a conformal transformation on one plane or a conformal transformation on the other plane. So there's a, it's this funny quotient. And that's the actual space that uh, uh, the, the moduli space for this, um, this thing that you want to study. Um, and um, uh, and I, there are different ways that you could try to cover that moduli space by playing with these different parameters. But in general, you get an over-parameterization. So you have to make some choices for the configuration you want. So if you pick this configuration where all the balls are tangent and you only adjust the betas, then that's, uh, that, that will allow you to cover the whole moduli space. And you, well, you have to also twist. You have to include angular twists on the spheres as well. Is there a simple geometrical explanation of this formula for beta, or it's just yeah, like yeah. Th this this comes from group theory. Um, so so the idea is just just uh, this observation that the hot spot action depends only on uh, these two balls that are becoming tangent. So to compute it, you can forget about the rest of the geometry and just pretend that you have two balls. And then that's actually equivalent um, to the s s one cross s d minus one partition function. Um, if you take two copies of the plane, and you glue them through two balls like this, two, two cylinders, then, um, then that's vial equivalent to SD minus one cross S1. So when you work that out, you find that this is the effective temperature of that SD minus one cross S1. Yeah, Dolly. So do you, do you, do you think, think there, there, could be some, there could be some picture which contains the interpolation between, between these results and the results of the light cone bootstrap? By results of the light cone bootstrap, you're talking about this, um, the, the thing that Sasha was asking about? 
uh, with the six mm. point functions and uh, well, oh, 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 I, I think I understand your question. For the density of states. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, that's right. So the light cone bootstrap predicts that the density of states at least um, at, at fixed twist and large spin looks like mean field theory. Um, and uh, um, uh, mean field, the mean field theory density of states is very different from this because it's like the, it's like the density of states of a theory in, in one higher dimension. Um, uh, and so there has to be some transition between them. Um, and uh, it's, I guess it was interesting to ask, first of all, whether there are intermediate regimes. So where, where you, there's something in between, there, there's the mean field theory regime near the, the mean field theory regime is near the unitarity bound. And then as you go away from the unitarity bound, what do you encounter until you, until you reach this regime? Uh, I, I'm not really sure, but I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. And it might, might even, it might also tie in with some of the things that uh, Simone and collaborators were thinking about in terms of like um, uh, the, where the Reggie intercept is and you know, if the, if the Reggie intercept is below one, the theory is not very chaotic in the Reggie regime and, and I think it's interesting to try to connect to those ideas. Cool. Any more questions? Sorry, can I? Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so can you just, so this uh, formula here, it's, it looks very pairwise, like you are highlighting, right? This, so, yeah. but after you transform back, uh, all the deltas will be entangled with each other, right? Generically. It's this pairwise, it's because you are in this. Uh, yeah, if you just Laplace transform, then the deltas don't, th th what happens is you get pairwise things in terms of these funny combinations like delta one plus delta two minus delta three. Um, over two. So you get, uh, if you define this to be delta one two, then the thing that you get from Laplace transforming this is just, um, is just a, a product of functions of these things. Um, but I don't know what happens when you like use the full conformal blocks. Mm. Yeah, because in DOZZ you get something like that but with some funny square roots, right? Square root of delta one plus square root of delta two minus square root of delta three. Hmm. If you take just the OZZ and then take the dimensions very large, yeah. there are some funny square roots. It's not this effective uh, yeah. uh, deltas that show up. Yeah, I mean, my, my, uh, I think what should be the case is that that should all come from the, from, from the Virasoro blocks that you have to invert to get, to get to the formula for C. I, I think that this, this should still be true. And the, the partition function, the equality between partition functions should, should still be true. In 2D, but yeah, when you when you invert, then these interesting things happen. That would be my guess. Yeah, we were digging through. Um, uh, we we're trying to find this formula in the 2D CFT literature, and we couldn't really find it. So, if anyone has any ideas, that would be great. Yeah, you have ideas. Okay, good. Oh. I had one comment about your answer to Delmas' question. There was a paper. There was a series of papers maybe by Zohar and Gabriel Cuomo that was in like an, an analogous case where they had the large charge um, yeah. regime and they had all these phases with the, the giant vortex, et cetera. Yeah. So maybe that's, uh, you know, this is like a different direction, but seems. Yeah, I'm glad, glad you said the words large charge. So this is, it's, this is sort of kind of in the spirit of the idea of trying to use EFT to describe large quantum number regimes. But this EFT is, is rather different from the large charge one. So yeah, it's interesting to, to try to connect them somehow, I'm not sure. There's one thing you can do, which is just add charge to this story. Um, and um, I think that uh, the results you get are, well, th that's basically what, um, in a paper by Hiroshi and Jeha and um, Monica and um, uh, who else was on the paper? Anyway, they, 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 they just, they didn't do spin and they just did charge. And there was a similar effective action uh, interpretation, but it didn't give as spectacular a result. It just gave like the leading uh, behavior in the charge for the density of states. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the full power is that you could get out of this formalism. But can yeah, I ask a question as well. Uh, can you imagine uh, adding like source terms to your act effective action to get like correlators of 
fluctuations at large distances and connect to transport that way? Uh, there's, some, there's probably, I mean, there's established stuff like this, but yeah, um, that 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 that's a good question. Yeah, so so um, if you if you have if you insert operators, then uh, at leading order, um, the correlators just factorize. Um, at, you know, at large Euclidean separation because you have a massive theory and so you just get a product of the thermal one-point functions of the operators. I think it would be nice if you could say something more detailed than that, uh, but I'm not really sure. The kind of transport coefficients you have, the kind of transport coefficients you have handled on are those that are not turned off in equilibrium. So for instance, viscosity will be completely invisible from this point of view because the fluid configuration that captures this configuration is one that turns off viscosity. Thanks. Okay, so I think uh, let's thank David again. Okay. Thank you.